Acesta este Curious Nine Podcast, prezentat de ING. Hello and welcome to the Curious Lion Podcast. This is a new episode and today we're going to talk about emotions, emotions and technology. And today we have a very special guest. She is called Pamela Pavlescak. And before talking to her, let me introduce her. Pamela is a tech emotionographer who believes in future with feeling. She is the founder of Future Feeling, an organization that studies our emotional relationship with technology. And her book, Emotionally Intelligent Design, charts a new path forward um, to an empathetic technology. Pamela, nice to have you at the Curious Ryan podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I mentioned in your bio that you are a tech emotionographer. And before jumping into a deeper conversation, I think that everyone um, is curious to find out what exactly is a tech emotionographer. Well, I couldn't find the right way to frame what I do to people. Uh, you know, so I came up with the term because I thought about, well, geographers, what are they doing? They're trying to map the, the lay of the land to figure out kind of what the territory is and to really um, chart a way for other people to understand it as well. And I thought that was a pretty good analogy for what I do because I spend a lot of time doing um, creative kinds of research and hosting conversations and playing around with a lot of different technologies to understand what's next for emotion. And how did you become interested in this relationship between technology and emotions? Well, I'm a researcher, so I've spent a lot of time over the past decade or more, uh, you know, talking to people, observing people, uh, trying to understand people, use technology. And it occurred to me that we're missing this big piece as technology creeps into more and more of our everyday lives it's emotional. We have a relationship with each other through technology and we have a relationship with the technology itself. And if we leave that part out of it, I think we're missing out on something that really makes us human. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, this because um, in, your, in your book, which I mentioned, Emotional Intelligent Designed, you are talking about the fact that technology evolved, it gather, as you say, IQ, it gather intelligence, but lacks emotions. So let's start by talking um, about this. Should technology think about emotions or, or, or is just a means to an end? Yeah, I think it, it's a big question. I don't know if I have an answer to that. I think <laughs> it's one that we need to, to think about and explore though, because what's happening now is there's a lot of new technology evolving that is trying to understand human emotion and um, detect it through signals like our face or our voice or even our pulse or anything like that. Um, trying to interpret those into some categories and then use that to either adapt the technology itself or to kind of mirror that back to us and have a more empathetic experience. Now, right now, it's very early days. It doesn't work very well. And there are a lot of problems with it. I think right now, it more, it's kind of like a toddler, you know, <laughs> it's really <laughs> at this early phase where it knows some really strong emotions, but it doesn't differentiate very well and it reflects back to us um, some of our stereotypes about emotions <laughs> too and so it's you know it, it, it's an interesting mirror to hold up to ourselves and to see like oh how do we express and experience emotion and how can technology make sense of that but it's pretty pretty basic right now <laughs> I think that um, um... In, in the past, um, our relationship with technology was one-sided. Uh, if we think about uh, how technology evolved, um, 
talking about, I don't know, uh, music, uh, uh, we were just listening to it. Um, mm -hmm. Then the, came the TV. And now we are entering this phase where it's not just a one-sided conversation where technology transmits to us something from, from another world, yeah. but it also starts to understand us more and give us more information based on what we're feeling, what we're thinking. So how did it change uh, and how does it change us? This, this switch to not just um, a one-sided conversation with technology. Yeah, it's well, it's already happening, right? That technology is trying to yeah. understand what we look at, what we search for, what we buy. Um, and now with the global pandemic, there's lots of new tools trying to understand um, what our coughs mean or our temperature as we go into a building. Uh, a lot of those same signals can be used to try and understand emotion and I, so I think that is a different phase that we're in, but it's interesting because it's happening at the same time that technology is still mediating human to human communication as well, right? So here we are on Zoom and it's a little strange, right? Because it's kind of cool in one way because you're yeah. far away. Um, but at the same time, like, ha are we really making eye contact? Or are we making eye contact with the camera? And same for social media. It's like we're we're making contact with each other, but it's through this lens of technology. So there's there's layers to it. And I think, you know, it's absolutely right to think about the fact that we design technology to to help us communicate, express ourselves, experience things, but it designs us right back in turn, you know, and it changes and shapes how we relate to each other and how we feel about things too. And I think that's something that it's hard to predict where that's going to go. What we want to happen though is for it not to limit us not to label us and say yeah you're this or you can only do this that's our big frustration right now with technology that knows us right and the most basic form of that is like ads that follow us around mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're like yeah i already bought that or that, that's not me anymore that was me like a few months ago now i'm over here and to have technology that sort of recognizes how we evolve and change we're just not there yet. It's interesting that you mentioned um, uh, this thing about about a Zoom conversation because <laughs> right now I'm I'm looking into a camera, an outside camera from the laptop. But when I'm talking with someone over the laptop camera, it's very weird right now, and I didn't understand that before the pandemic. That yeah. if you want to look into the person's eyes, you cannot look into the camera. <laughs> on on Zoom, so it's it's this constant switch between I'm going to look in the camera because I want that person to see me that I'm mm -hmm. watching him or her, but also I want to look at at that person and I cannot do it. I know, I know. It's, a, it's kind of it's kind of funny to think about. And so imagine if you know a couple years out we layer onto that some kind of readout of what we're feeling. Um, it's hard enough, right, to look at somebody, to look at them on screen, to look at the camera, maybe to follow chat. And then we may have other sort of readouts of like, um, you know, what their tone is. Uh, we're seeing lots of products emerge along that lines already. I mean, there have been some in the past, but Amazon's Halo, for instance, um, is a wearable now that gives you feedback on your tone of voice and I guess the assumption is you'll learn something from that and maybe adjust your tone <laughs> once in a while <laughs> or or I, or I don't know feel self-conscious at least <laughs> so I yeah. think it, it's very true it's you know we're we're adding this kind of intelligence and we're trying to add some emotional intelligence but it's one big experiment and we're experimenting on ourselves in the midst of all of it. Um, going back a bit to the evolution mm -hmm. of, of technology. And I, and I remember an, an interview that I saw and I liked very much with, with David Bowie. Mm -hmm. um, it was around 2000 
and he was yeah. talking about the internet mm. and now nowadays it's it's perceived as one of the um, most interesting conversations about internet before internet is became what is today um, he was calling it influential and um, area in life form not just a medium so what did the internet do to our relationship with technology? <laughs> well, in a way, it made this kind of strange situation, right, where we have um, kind of a double of ourselves that is following us around all the time. So that's made up of, you know, our, our interactions and our, our data. Um, it's also changed our relationships with each other though too in you know obvious ways like it's shortened distance we're able to be in touch with each other um, we're able to to connect in new ways but it's also given us new ways to formulate how we communicate to each other so if you look at say informal language and all the writing that we do um, that's certainly changed and I think the same holds true for how we express our feelings. When we're on the internet, we have really strong feelings and we can spread them far and wide really quickly for good or bad. Um, but we also distance ourselves from our feelings too, kind of as a coping strategy, right? Like we saw that early days with the pandemic where people were sharing all kinds of memes about their panic about toilet paper, for instance, or how they're retreating to, you know, art and imitating art works. And so we have, um, you know, we're developing a broader repertoire of responses for our emotions and our and uh, new ways to experience it too. Um, I want to go back a bit, uh, go forward actually, um, going from 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 the internet um, to the hardware to the gadgets we use uh, mm -hmm. because. They also have changed and they are not just, as I said, and as you mentioned, um, just a means to an end, just tools, just simple tools. They are a mirror to uh, for ourselves. They are a mirror to the world. How did it change us, this maybe intimate, more intimate relationship with technology? Yeah, it's so interesting because I think if somebody had said to you 10 years ago that you're going to look at your phone and touch your phone more than like your pets or your partner, you'd be like, oh, no, no way, no way. But um, <laughs> that you would reveal details to, um, you know, to Google <laughs> in your searches that you wouldn't share with anyone else, we would say, oh, no, that's, that's ridiculous. We would never do that. But here we are doing that. And there's something about technology that is so close to us it's in our hand it's in our pocket it's right in front of us on our desk that it feels very intimate it feels very personal and we tend to to open up to it we also feel a little disassociated with our regular self so that we and that can be good that can be really freeing right you can take on sort of a whole new um kind of persona but it can also be uh, make you feel a little too disconnected from people. So it's this weird feeling that we're dealing with where we're, we're kind of this freedom and the sense of, of being connected with people, but also at the same time apart and standing back and, and distanced. And I think a lot of our gadgets really um, layer in that complexity for us because it's such an intimate space that we have with them. And I think that because you mentioned that it's also um, gadgets and, and and are bringing a, a bit of freedom and a, and a different persona for us. And I was thinking, and I don't know if we do it this, if we do this um, um, consciously, because, um, for example, uh, we see this online with um this polarization not just political but with mm -hmm. any any subject and people are being more free to write to comment um maybe they are more aggressive and less empathetic than they would be 
in real life. And I was thinking, who are we? For example, if online I'm taking I'm taking my phone and I'm and I'm just a hater. I'm I'm commenting and everything. But in real life, I couldn't do it. Mm, I, I, yeah. I would be ashamed of me of talking like this. I mean, if if I I would read out loud my comments hypothetically. Yeah, yeah. We haven't built in that that sense of. I mean, it's it's all those social emotions that we have, right? And some of those are good. Those are like compassion and empathy and altruism that we'll feel in person when we're seeing somebody, um, or even through technology when we're when we're confronted with people face to face, right? But there's also so many negative social emotions too. Like you said, shame and guilt, and those can have positive effects. Um, a little bit of a little bit of shame at your behavior, a little bit of guilt kind of holds society together in some ways. And I think we're also just grappling with how, you know, we know in our personal circles, like say your immediate family, how emotions can be contagious, right? One person's in a bad mood. Suddenly everybody's, you know, angry and slamming doors and whatever. So you can tell I live with teenagers. And um, <laughs> you can, you know, but online we don't see that effect as clearly and and then we wonder we're like oh why is it so polarized like this well, how did it get this way um and part of it is that sort of cumulative effect of of emotion and i mean so that means it's on us and technology to do a better job not just you know, making sure things aren't disinformation, but also putting in some of that humanity back into our interactions. Maybe that's a pause. Maybe that's some way to empathize um, with the other person. And so that's something that I think we'll be trying to figure out for the next decade of the internet. <laughs> the first decade, the last decade was figuring out how to connect everyone. This next one will be like how to really connect everyone. Um, you mentioned that that um, um, devices are, are becoming more and more personal. And I was thinking um, um, about about the design of of technology and how addictive they are smartphones tablets laptops um, was it bad luck that they are so addictive or do you think they it was addictive by design intentional almost i think it's probably a little bit of both um, there's definitely been a movement to make design more and more persuasive to understand cognitive biases and human motivation and more about our psychology that can then be used to change our behavior in various ways and of course as as a, an aside that also changes our emotional <laughs> texture of it, the experience too um but um, I, I think, and I think a lot of that is by design that I do think there's a lot of addictive properties kind of built into design these days. So maybe at first it started by accident and now it's more intentional. A lot of that has to do with what we measure though too, right? I mean, if you are measuring attention then you want to keep people on the app. If you are selling ads, then you want to keep people in that kind of loop um, that makes them feel ashamed, tired, anxious, whatever, but it's good for business, right? And I, so I think that's, you know, the ultimate kind of the higher layer behind all the design that we do is we have to look at what we're measuring and, think about is that getting people to a good place there's a short-term gain but maybe there's a long-term loss to that you you wrote in your book about about how emotions um, were transformed by design and you mentioned that um, 
some of some of the design based on data based on what we are doing um, is made to to keep us there so can can you give me some 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 examples of this kind of addictive design that that works to keep people there yeah i mean i think the the mo and this can again be ranged from sort of a positive to a negative but there's all kinds of techniques that help uh you know companies keep people online and a lot of that can be gamification types of things like badges or levels or competition so that's one whole category another category is something that's a little more subtle like um, an invariable reward right so for instance when you refresh twitter right then <laughs> like it give you might get something good you might not but you just keep going now there are other forces that work there as well but that's a design feature that that keeps you in that mode of always being on always seeking more um, some of it is just design techniques that keep us connected with other people right we have a lot of things that we that keep us engaged like um, managing our own reputation um, and getting that kind of social validation or feedback and so you see that in the form of likes is the most basic one where it can keep us engaged we're, we're looking did we get more how many did we get um we're deleting things that didn't get any sometimes because that doesn't feel so good guilty. so you know <laughs> guilty as charged yeah, on, on, on this <laughs> we, <method>. all are. <laughs> yeah. we all are. We all are. You mentioned about about feeds and and uh, Twitter feeds. Um, you can we can go also to the uh, way Facebook developed mm -hmm. um, in the last few years. Maybe yeah. maybe it was at first an utopian dream, connecting with the family, connecting with friends, and I remember this yeah. time when yeah. my friends were just family uh, friends uh, and some some unknowns um, but how now now we are we are talking about uh, when we're thinking about facebook for example and not only mm -hmm. we are talking about issues for our mental health uh, issues for our for democracies around the world Mm -hmm. um, how can we make, in the end, technology stick to the initial plan of connecting us? Because yeah. I, I saw in the last in the last few years there were uh, uh, numerous uh, new social networks that uh, were saying this is better than Facebook. This will be more civil. This will be um, more ethical. It didn't stick. Yeah, they didn't. I think I tried most of those. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least a few. Peach, Ello, Mastodon. I don't know. I could go yeah. on. Um, you know, ever hopeful. I wonder if social networks are the wrong analogy, the wrong way mm -hmm. to connect us. Um, and I know other people are thinking about this too. Maybe they have to be smaller again. I mean, if you think about our relationships in the real world, there's the famous Dunbar number, right? Robin Dunbar did research and said, hey, mm -hmm. about 150 is where we max out. And after that, um, you know, no, we, <laughs> we can't handle that anymore. So it could be that we need smaller circles. Um, I think that will appeal to some people. I think some people do that already and keep certain social networks small. Um, but there may be things that we can do with the design to help put some guardrails on on things to give people time to reflect. You notice Twitter's starting to do that now by um, having prompting you to comment on a retweet rather than doing it or labeling disinformation. That's a good start. Um, I don't think it's going to solve 
the, the issue entirely, but maybe there's something that even is beyond these social networks that we need to be more experimental with. And I don't know what those things are yet. I can imagine, you know, smaller conversations, though, taking hold for sure. That seems like an easy one. Yeah, if I if I remember well, maybe two years ago, Mark Zuckerberg said that, uh, ironically, the future will be uh, private when talking about <laughs> about groups. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, when talking about groups on Facebook and uh, restraining basically the conversation outside the news feed, which is like howling at the entire world, if you are doing it publicly. Um, but when when thinking about about doing smaller numbers in technology, can you see a future where technology can address for for someone? A smaller number of people and also be be a good business because it's always nowadays on the internet about big numbers about yeah. getting the more more and more engagement likes ads everything yeah i mean part of it it's all interconnected isn't it i mean you have yeah. this this business model that is ad based so that's attention based and that kind of works against our mental health and our well-being and and uh, the spread of disinformation as well. Um, so that model poses a challenge, right? Um, the fact that the space is tends to be controlled by a few big players, I think is also a challenge for smaller startups. The idea of a startup maybe not wanting to scale beyond a certain point seems, you know, unthinkable right now, mm -hmm. but that could be a, a solution, you know, so part of it's the model, part of it is the patterns we use and what we value. So a lot of our design patterns are geared towards short term, driving up numbers so that you can show a good quarter or get more funding or whatever the goal is. Um, what if we thought longer term, then we might look at patterns that are emotionally sustainable, that build a relationship gradually, that um, factor in positive patterns, like we know are, are true, like gratitude, right? There's tons of research that says if you're thankful for things in your life and you spend a little time doing that each day, you actually become more altruistic too, you know? So there are things that we could explore from the design piece, but we also have to look at kind of the, the business model piece of it as well. They're, they're intertwined. You, you talked about gamification and it's not just only on, um, on social networks. We see this in apps. We see that in, in gaming where nowadays developers are using tools that can basically um, simulate our our journey to to a, a technological product. They know where we were stuck and maybe open a gate for us, mm -hmm. then to close it again. Um, how can we balance this this use of of data, which is fascinating in the end, using big data mm -hmm. to to understand. Uh, the way we are using products, which may be a more ethical approach. Right. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, as you can see from all the conversations and technology now, I think that's one of our biggest challenges. It's often framed as an ethical challenge, like how do we balance um, keep, to keep collecting this data, but do it in an ethical way so that people know what we're collecting that they have a say in how that's collected and then they know how it's being used. We haven't met that challenge yet, <laughs> right? That's still, we're still figuring that part out. I think it's promising that that is a big discussion in our field right now. I also think that at a certain point, our, 
are the people who are using technology have become a lot more aware of these techniques and a lot more conscious of how technology might be designed to have a certain effect on them. And I wonder if that's not going to be an area of pressure in the next few years is that that people will actually push back a little and say like, yeah, that's I don't want that or if especially if there's a choice and an alternative and I think the gaming space is much different from social networks social networks right it's like all about the people and that's a hard challenge but with games there's lots of choices and um, you know the current gamification techniques actually don't work on everybody anyway right not everyone's into like competition and levels and badges and all that um, in the first place so it's kind of limited so i think that you know that area may see uh some pushback especially since in also in gaming there is um so the the dsm for psychology does have you know online gaming addiction as a as a condition whereas like online addiction isn't yet because they're still defining it i think not because it doesn't <laughs> exist but because <laughs> they're still figuring out how to define it but for gaming there is so i think that this is another um way that people might become more aware of that and and offer a little bit of um you know a, a stop <laughs> yeah. i heard this opinion uh that um, because of the last few months of the pandemic, of the way we are uh, working from home, sitting inside, not meeting as, as much with friends and using technology every single minute, more than we did last year. Yeah. After the pandemic, when things will go back to a certain normal, people will... Um, stand back a bit from technology. They will want more uh, um, true emotions, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, more human interaction. It's, it's utopian to think like this? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think <laughs> we might see a little bit of that. I think we might also see that our habits have changed and that things that we wouldn't have thought would have been acceptable last year are right we're coming up on the holidays in the us and people are not spending time in person with their families they're you know lamenting that they have to do holidays on zoom or keep it much smaller at the same time we might find well we don't actually miss that as much as we thought or that in certain cases that can be a good thing or we simply might just be in the habit of doing that and i think everyone's trying to puzzle that out when it comes to working from home for instance companies are trying to puzzle out well are people going to want to keep working at home do we want to go back to having this big office space what are the advantages to it um so i think we'll see people definitely you know there's a there's a fatigue with staying inside and being on our machines all day and i think we'll see lots of you know real life in person stuff happening again i hope so but i do think there'll be certain habits of ours that will that will change and it will change how we relate to each other as well nowadays um in mainstream technology, um, even if uh, developers have tools to measure, um, they have facial recognition, voice recognition, maybe emotional uh, analysis, it's not so much used in mainstream technology, not as, not that we know of. Yeah. So uh, do you think that this will be an influential point in the future for technology to understand us better? Like browsing, browsing a website, fearing, seeing you, which is weird from a privacy point of view, mm -hmm. and maybe changing the content based on what's, what is understanding about you? Yeah, well, I do think, I mean, all of the big players are in this space. So Google actually has a patent for just that. It 
uh, the, through the webcam, seeing your facial expression, maybe not broadcasting it to everybody, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but <laughs> Google seeing it and detecting a grimace or a, a frown and adjusting the search results accordingly. Now, they're a long way off, I think, from doing that well. I think you could do a terrible job at that pretty soon. <laughs> like, but just imagine you're looking at a screen with search results. How much facial expression do you really have when you're looking at a screen? Unless you're looking at another person, you really don't. So that may be one where like the input is kind of a mismatch to the output. Now, you know, take on the other hand, Amazon has a patent for Alexa to look to detect illness from your voice. Right. And that's there's been a ton of research with the Mayo Clinic on detecting, say, heart disease in your voice. And they've had a good experience with that. Already people are nervous about their health as it stands and they're ordering more and more from Amazon. That probably is going to continue even if we have widespread vaccination and everything's under control as people will be used to that convenience. That's one that could could make some headway. Now, again, how accurate will it be? It might be accurate enough to pick up that you have a cold or that you're feeling a little bit down. It might not pick up any context about that. You know, why are you, um, you know, what precipitated that? Are you sick? Or are you just uh, feeling a little blue that day? Are you having a mental health crisis? Like those kind of and really important nuances it probably won't get but i think that has more of a chance of working its way into our our day-to-day -day lives pamela thank you very much for a fascinating conversation thank you thank you all for listening or watching the curious lion podcast we talked about emotions and if you found it found it interesting drop us a line tell us about your relationship with technology. My name is Vlad Andreescu and have a good time.